about 1950 paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, is precisely whether computers can think. And um, he notices that the question as asked is very confusing. We don't even know how to approach it. How do we even go about trying to answer such a question? Can a computer think? So that's why he proposes to replace it, reformulate that rather, as could a computer play the imitation game successfully? The imitation game has come to be called the Turing test for mentality. And so can computer strength becomes can computers pass the Turing test? And before I describe the Turing test, I should tell you a little bit about the, the author, right? Alan Turing. Have you seen the imitation game, the movie, which came out a few years ago? I think it is worth watching. Very important British mathematician. We call him the father of computer science. He died in 1954, four years after writing the paper that you've read. During World War II, he made a very important contribution to the war effort. He worked for the British government and helped decode German radio communication. After the war, he was prosecuted for being gay. That's how society saw fit to express its gratitude. And he had to choose between prison time and chemical castration. He chose the latter. How did he die? Under very mysterious circumstances, um, the official cause of death he ate an apple right before going to bed, which he would always do, one of his habits. And the last one that he ate was tainted with cyanide. Some speculated that he was just absent minded, lots of chemicals in his house because he was interested in scientific experiments, and that one got tainted accidentally. But most people think he was probably suicide, not unrelated to what had been done to him. Very sad ending to the story. Coming back to one of the questions he was interested in the most, right? Can computers think or can they play the imitation game described by Turing? Can they pass the Turing test? What is the Turing test like? I'll describe it in detail, but you should know from the very beginning that it's a behavioral test for mentality. What does that mean? It means the only thing that matters is the computer's behavior, and it's even more restrictive than that, all that matters is the computer's verbal behavior, its ability to imitate very accurately the responses that the average human would give to various questions. And if the computer can imitate the human closely enough for a long enough period of time, that's the general idea, then it qualifies as a thinking thing. What are the details? to the game. In stage one, the three players are an interrogator, a man, and a woman. Interrogator, man, woman. They're located in separate rooms, cannot see or hear one another. They communicate via typewritten messages. The interrogator sends them questions, then receives and analyzes their answers. The goal being two participants, the man and the woman. The woman tries to help the interrogator make the correct identification, while the man tries to pass for a woman. He tries to deceive the interrogator into thinking they're talking to a woman. The game is played many, many times with different pairs of a man and a woman, and we look at the number of cases, the percentage of cases, in which the interrogator is tricked in that fashion is tricked by the male participant into thinking that's a woman. I'm going to pick a specific number, just uh, work with something concrete. Let's assume that after the first round of the game is played many times, the interrogator is deceived exactly 40% of the time. The men are not so bad. We're pretending they're women. 40% of the time. Second stage of the game. In the second stage of the game, we have again an interrogator, and the other two participants are a human and a computer. The gender of the human this time doesn't matter. Human, computer. Again, 
they communicate via type written messages, the, the, the humans cannot see any of the other participants. Um, the interrogator sends the other two questions, who receives their answers, and analyzes them. The goal this time being to figure out which one is the human and which one is the machine. The interrogator knows that exactly one of them is a machine and is trying to figure out which one. The goal of the human in this game is to help the interrogator make the correct identification. While the computer plays the role of the deceptive party from before, the computer was programmed to deceive an interrogator into thinking they're talking to a human. So the goal of the programmer is to create a software that would enable the computer to answer questions on a very broad range of topics, pretty much as the average human person would answer them. Again, the game is played many, many times, the second round. And Torik's claim is that if the interrogator is tricked by the computer, if you said the opposite, if they were tricked by the man here in the first round of the game, so if um, the failure rate, the failure in identifying the two, um, the failure rate is at least 40% in our example, then the computer passes the test and qualifies as a thinking thing. If not, not, but Turing himself was very optimistic. He thought that by the end of the century, the previous century, which is already over, um, computers would manage to trick an interrogator trying to figure out what they are, a human or a machine, at least 30% of the time after a five minute conversation. That still hasn't happened, by the way. We still don't have computer programs capable of doing that. Say, does it make sense? So the underlying assumption is that if you have a human and some other physical system and they are behaviorally extremely similar, they respond in the same way to the same questions, in roughly the same way, right? If they're input-output equivalent, then they're also psychologically equivalent. Since the human clearly has mental state, we should say the same thing about the computer. We should attribute mentality to the computer in the very same sense of the word. Just because it's able to behave in a certain way, it's able to duplicate human verbal behavior when answering a whole bunch of questions over um, lots and lots of possible topics. What I'd like you to think about for now, I'm gonna look at the imitation game, of course, in a lot of detail, so we'll try to evaluate this toward the end of today, but for now, can you please make a list of questions that you would ask if you were the interrogator in this game, and I'm interested mostly in the second stage of free to discuss the first one too as a warm-up. <coughs> but most importantly, if you were the interrogator in the second stage of the game, what exactly <coughs> would you ask? You don't want to waste time, right? You have a very clear goal in mind. One of those is a human, one is a computer. Which is which? You don't want to waste time asking things that are irrelevant, unhealthy. Please discuss that in groups and try to come up with a written list of questions you deem important.
I said, uh, what's your significant other like? Mm -hmm. uh, mainly because like, or something like, or something along the lines of a question like that, like even if it's like, how's your day going? If it's someone like me on the other side, I would just go, it's great. I mean, it's great, she's fine. I, like I don't really give like detailed answers. I don't really give like detailed answers and I would expect maybe an AI would give a little more detailed of an answer. Mm -hmm, that's interesting. It depends on your personality. Yeah. And remember, if, <laughs> yeah. if you have a certain goal as a human participant, your goal is to help the interrogator make the identification. Um, so you might be inclined actually to give a lot of details and same thing rather than being very succinct. If that's really your aim, helping the interrogator figure out who's a human, who's the computer. I expect that varies from person to person. Some might be much more willing to share details about their family, friends, and so on. Yeah, and um, also if the computer is programmed to deceive, then um, it's not going to offer a three-page length, a three-page long description of their so-called significant other or friend, right? Um, so again, an adequately programmed computer is going to try to mimic what the average human would do. What else? What other ideas have you come up with? Give the computer access to entire psychology treatises, right? 
about how the human psyche works, what the typical experiences are at each age, and so on and so forth, right? How does that help you determine which is which? I feel like you might be Brian's other question. Pardon? Complex math model well, seems to be a fix for that. Describing past experiences, especially important experiences, often people ask questions about emotions. Mm -hmm. The assumption being that we, of course, um, feel emotions, but you know, we wouldn't be there if they would need to mimic it, and it would become clear that they're just going through the motions. Yes. Um, would like asking. Uh, what was your school life like? Yeah, it's a possible question. And um, why couldn't you get from the computer a description of the typical 16-year-old's school life? Mm -hmm. Depends on what age they have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it has the right database available and um, a sufficiently sophisticated program running. Make mistakes and a computer's infallibility, which would give it away. But the 
other ones are new. Does it make sense what I'm asking you to do? Mm -hmm. Evaluate each of the four arguments and also rank them from the best to the worst. Computers lack originality. It's so funny you say that because now we have computers that when I think of originality, I think of stuff like art. And now we have computers that like just turn in a few keywords and they can like make whole That's kind of one website that like a story or whatever. Like I heard like I heard there's just like one website that's like an AI just like lines out like a story based on a few keywords that you get or something like that. Yeah, so it's like it's
trick you into thinking you're talking to a human, but that's not going to be thought, genuine thought, because the soul would still be missing. Now, regardless of your own religious views, because usually belief in souls is religiously motivated, you bracket that, and regard the matter from a rational perspective, what might be some problems with such an argument from a philosophical angle? This is what he says, right? One of the things that um, Turing says in response to this, maybe God becomes so impressed, if there is a God, with these computers and their performance that he decides to be so sold upon them, right? In which case, um, they would be able to think even according to this definition. But on a more serious note, right? What's your argument for thinking that we have souls and that's why we have mental states? You already know from our discussion at Descartes that substance dualism, which is the view relied upon here, is highly controversial. Very difficult to support rationally. Descartes offered some arguments for the existence of an immaterial soul, but they are deeply problematic, including the most interesting and the strongest one, the conceivability argument. It would be nice if we could evaluate the Turing test without committing ourselves to deeply problematic metaphysical views, such as the view that there are souls, that we have souls. So a lot of metaphysical baggage is as far as this um, argument is concerned, controversial metaphysical baggage, not a very strong objection. We're left with one employee. I want to do the wing first. Computers can only do what a human programmed them to do. They can never go beyond the algorithm that they were given. And in that sense, one could argue they lack originality. While humans typically can come up with original new ideas and tools. They're not limited in the way in which computers work. Strong or weak, what did you say about this one? Did I say weak? Usually, mainly say strong. No, you said the strongest. Okay, the strongest of these, you think that's still, in the end, a problematic argument. You don't find it convincing. Okay, why weak? Why strong? Let's um, get some conversation going. Why strong? How do you understand originality and why do you think that computers don't have access to it? Well, I think it's the strongest because it applies to so many different other ways that kind of like so so I think that's engines is like the biggest one because they actually have a like a software for like they can use that people do use that. Right, but why does it seem convincing, at least at first, to those of you who do find it convincing? Right, we tend to have a very good opinion about ourselves, as usual, right, in this respect, too. We think of ourselves as creative, original, and it seems to us that a mere artifact manufactured and programmed by us Right, couldn't match us in creativity. Remember what he says, Turing says in response to this? What is originality, first of all? We need to clarify the term. By original, you mean simply that that physical system has the capacity to surprise an observer. Well, then my computer surprise me all the time, he says, because I often don't take the trouble to do the calculation precisely enough and then the computer does something that I didn't anticipate, so I'm surprised. In that sense, it is original. If by originality you mean, however, something much stronger, surprising an observer, no matter how much that observer might know about the current state of the system, right, then a very strong understanding of originality, then it's not clear that we are original, we human beings, in that sense, right? And then it's not fair to hold computers to a higher standard than the standard we apply to 
human beings. Yes, Alina? I was thinking we were talking about, you know, consciousness a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I remember you making us watch that, uh, sh that short film, They're Made of Meat. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it has something to do with the fact that we're made of, you know, organic material as opposed to a computer, which is made of metal and wires and, mm -hmm. yeah. and you know, all sorts of artificial materials, whereas we're made of organic substances. Yeah, that does turn out to be strong. He's strong, as I said, is the next author on the list. Um, he's against the possibility of artificial intelligence, doesn't think that computers will ever think by running a program. And one reason why he says these things is that, in his view, mental states are the result of biological states of the brain. He thinks there's something about the stuff we're made out of that makes us capable of it. What the argument for that is, that's a separate question. But, but um, I mean, somebody um, like Turing, somebody who um, is a computationalist, somebody who thinks that computers can think in the end if they're programmed adequately, would say that the reason why we can think has to do with higher level, more abstract properties of the brain, not these lower level properties that have to do with the stuff we're made out of. Something more abstract, which can in principle be shared between human beings and adequately programmed computers. There's a huge controversy. That. Yeah, I want to save consciousness for later. That is related to argument one. And coming back to originality for a second, where does that leave us? Right? What do you mean by originality? What if you mean being able to surprise an investigator, an interrogator, or um, an observer, no matter how much information that observer might have about that entity? current state of that entity. Then we get an interesting interaction here between questions about the possibility of artificial intelligence and the freedom of the What if the world is deterministic and everything that happens could have been predicted by somebody knowledgeable enough, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of years ago, certainly before that person the agent who was born, the agent who performed the action, or the thinker who came up with these so-called original ideas. In a deterministic universe, all our actions, all our ideas, and all our thoughts could have been predicted by somebody knowledgeable enough before our birth. Suppose you see tomorrow in the New York Times on the first page, scientific discovery. The world is deterministic. Um, determinism holds true everywhere in the universe. No exceptions. Would you then be inclined to conclude or read that means we lack originality because every single idea, every single artwork, uh, all of these things could have been anticipated, could have been predicted before that thinker's birth or before that artist's birth. That means we don't think. That means we lack thought because we lack originality. Is that how we would react to such a scientific discovery? No, of course we have thoughts. That's not up for debate. We know that human beings can think. It would follow, I suppose, that our thoughts are much more boring than we used to be, at least for somebody who knows enough about the initial condition, so to speak. Does it make sense? So defining originality in this strong sense can't be used in an argument to show computers lack thoughts, because if you apply the standards to human beings, the same standards to human beings, beings, to be fair, you reach the conclusion that human beings have thoughts, and that's absurd. <coughs> Turing doesn't think that any of these objections is successful, including the originality one, and um, he has responses to all of them. If you look at the paper, you know what I'm talking about, including the one about originality. Let's now move on to the last one, the ability to enjoy stories and how would you rank this one without being given any details, any information, any background skills? What's so special about stories and cream and the ability to enjoy them that that's required for thought? Running a computer program can never be sufficient for consciousness. He 
this is just an example of drawing strawberries and cream. The idea is that you can never program a computer to have quality. You can program it to behave as though it has quality. To behave as though it felt pain when there's damage to the robot, not just the computer, right? There's damage to the robot's body. You can program it to behave as though it had sensations of red, blue, green, etc. As though it felt jealousy, as though it experienced various things. It could behave exactly in the way in which a human behaves when having these experiences, but you can never program a computer to feel these things. Yeah, very good. Let's look at what Turing says in response to this. Here's how he formulates, he reconstructs the consciousness and then his response to it. The argument, the consciousness objection, relies on um, an important principle that's controversial. It's called the connection principle. As I said, Searle endorses it, but other philosophers would reject it. The connection principle says that mental states require intentional, require consciousness, right? or intentionality requires consciousness for some being, for some physical system to have intentionality, it must have consciousness. You can't have mentality in the absence of consciousness. Some philosophers think it's a compelling principle, others disagree. Premise one, thought in general requires consciousness. You can't have mental states in the absence of consciousness. And then we go on and say, well, behavioral evidence Mere behavioral evidence is never sufficient for attributing consciousness to a computer. You only have access to the computer's behavior, computer slash robot. Um, the verbal behavior is what we concentrate on in the Turing test. And that kind of evidence is never sufficient to justify attributions of consciousness. For all you know, the computer might just be going through the motions. No pain, no enjoyment when eating strawberries and cream and so on and so forth. No gustatory sensation at all. No quality. Therefore, computers will never be able to have thought because they will never be able to have consciousness, or at least attributions of thought and consciousness on the basis of the computer passing the Turing test are unjustified because they rely solely on behavioral evidence. How does Turing react to this objection? That's related to what well, let's think about the grounds we have for attributing mentality and consciousness to other human beings. Doesn't that rely solely on behavioral evidence too? On what grounds do I think that you have a headache right now or do you feel excited and you find the topic interesting in the discussion interesting? I observe your behavior. I notice your facial expression. I notice that maybe you hold your head uh, and you start groaning, whatever, and I remember that in my case, when I do these things, it's because I have a very bad headache. I know this behavioral evidence displayed by you. I know that these behaviors are correlated with certain mental states in my case, and I conclude that you probably have a headache too, or you probably feel excited too, because I know that I look that way when I'm excited. So, the only evidence we have for attributing consciousness in is behavioral evidence, but of course we know there are other minds. Skepticism about other minds is absurd. Therefore, such behavioral evidence is enough when attributing consciousness to other humans, and if it's enough there, why shouldn't it be enough when we ascribe consciousness to computers? It's the same kind of evidence. If it's good enough when dealing with other human beings, it should be good enough when dealing with computers. So in other words, his response to the consciousness objection is to say if you endorse this objection, that commits you to skepticism about other minds. That's how he tries to scare the um, exponent of this view away. You can't embrace the uh, consciousness objection because if you do, you become a skeptic about other minds. 
which is an absurd position, something that flies in the face of common sense. Is it fair here, when comparing the evidence we have for attributing consciousness to other humans to the evidence we have for attributing consciousness to the computer that passes the test? Is it true that all we rely upon is behavior in both cases? So we should treat the two cases in the same way. If that's good enough evidence for a human, it should also be good enough for a computer. What more do we rely on? You're shaking your head. Like I said, we're made, of, we're made of organic material. The computer is not made of organic material. And you know, based on you know, what we've been talking about in earlier lessons, it seems that consciousness seems to be connected to being made of organic matter in some form. Yeah. Or at least that's the only case where, it's no, where we know for sure it occurs, right? Mm -hmm. In my own case, I know for sure that there's consciousness, and also know for sure about my brain and what it's made out of. Right, so here's a possible criticism of Turing's response. These are long chain of, chains of arguments that are sometimes hard to follow, but this is a very important exercise for you. Arguments, objections, responses, further objections, further responses. It's good to try to keep the chain of arguments relatively clear in your head. Possible criticism of Turing. When presenting our argument in support of the conclusion that other humans have mental states, he misdescribes it. When presenting it, he doesn't do it full justice. When attributing mental states to other people, other humans, we rely on more than merely behavioral evidence. There is also neurological evidence. I know in my own case that conscious states are correlated with behaviors in certain ways, and also know that they're correlated with neural states in certain ways, or at least that's information that I can easily acquire. I notice what you do, you display similar behaviors to mine under similar circumstances, and I also know what's inside your skull. Namely, there is a brain there that's very similar to mine. In this principle, the expectation that the neural firings occurring in your brain when you behave the way you do are very similar to the ones occurring in my brain that are associated with those very same behaviors, right? So the evidence we have for thinking that other human beings are conscious is not merely behavioral. There's also neurological evidence. Our similarities, the similarities between us and other humans go beyond the similarities between us and computers. The computer doesn't have a brain of the kind we do, right? And in that case, we do indeed rely only on behavior. There's an important asymmetry here that Turing downplays. Questions? examples in the media and it just makes so much it's happened so many times that we think that I mean it could it's only a matter of time if you know what I mean I know what you mean although I also feel like asking what makes you so confident that it will happen you know we haven't seen artificial intelligence yet or at least we haven't seen programs able to pass the Turing test yet and arguably that's needed for genuine artificial intelligence, although it's still contentious that it's sufficient for genuine artificial intelligence. Um, yeah, so what makes you so sure that artificial intelligence is possible? What makes the rest of you, or some of the rest, be sure that it can't happen? It'll be interesting to read Searle, who disagrees with Turing, because Turing was very optimistic. Searle thinks it's not a matter of technological limitations. You can imagine a program that does indeed enable the computer to pass the Turing test. How much thinking is that computer going to be able to do? Zero, none, so argues. It's not a matter of complexity. There's something, something specific about computer programs that makes computer incapable of thought just by virtue of running a program. 
And just to give it away a little bit, make you curious, uh, maybe about reading the essay. Searle emphasizes the fact that computer programs are simply sets of rules right, for correlating inputs and outputs. And what all these rules share in common, their crucial feature, and what in fact uh, makes the computer incapable of understanding, is that they're purely formal. Squiggle, squiggle goes with squiggle, squiggle. And another chain of ones and zeros, right, assuming that there's a binary code used by the computer, goes with this other chain of ones and zeros. But they're purely formal in the sense that the inputs and the outputs are described solely in terms of the sequence of symbols, their shapes, and their order. And um, if you simply execute a program consisting in such rules, squiggle, squiggle is correlated with squiggle, squiggle, you're never going to understand what it is you're doing, unless you have some other way of figuring that out. Just by shuffling symbols in accordance with such rules, you never understand anything. You never acquire anything like consciousness or mentality. That's the bottom line. But he uses a famous thought experiment to support this claim, the Chinese ring thought experiment. So any arguments for or against the possibility of artificial intelligence is coming from you. certainly is possible. Like, I don't know if you've seen the movie Board Games, but um, it's basically they have computers that do learn and like do missile simulations, like simulations of nuclear war, and they do learn from their mistakes that they made through previous rounds of this little game that they that it plays. And uh, so I do think it is possible for computers to learn and become less and less likely to make mistakes over time, similar to these computers, to the computers in the movie, but I don't think they'll ever be able to get consciousness like we humans do. Right, and then the question is, is that genuine learning? If you say learning, that means knowledge. Knowledge is a mental state. If somebody, if something is capable of learning, of acquiring knowledge, that entity has thought. Right? So you are willing to grant that computers <coughs> can have thoughts, but you don't think that they can, they, they can have uh, consciousness. Because you think that the two are separable, is that the idea? Okay. <coughs> I will be. Once they drink some water. Yes. So what? Wait, were you going to answer something else? Uh, no, I was asking you, right? So do you mean that computers can't become conscious, but that they can have thoughts? They, well, not that they can have thoughts, because when I guess when I say learn, maybe the better term is refine. Mm -hmm. They refine the way they do things. Well, the movie uses the term learn, but I guess refine would probably be better mm -hmm. since refining can apply to different things and learning, as you said, is a mental state. Mm -hmm. Right, so they can improve their performance, right, which would mimic the performance of an understanding human. That is yes, they can optimize themselves, maybe mm -hmm. is a better word. Right, but would they acquire mental states in the process? Drawing says yes. Says no. Something to think about. Okay. Any other thoughts that you'd like to share with us on, on this topic? Or questions that you have about the material introduced today? Nothing? Okay. We will, though, need to get into the habit of talking about these things at some point. I think that's useful to you. I told you that last is an activity, something you do. Passive, trying to absorb information. That's not all there is to philosophy. We want to ask you one 